We all have our own interesting stories. Each of them is unique and interesting in its own way. I'll tell you mine. About the time someone tried to steal me in the maternity ward. Personally, I was proud of that story. I liked to tell it to my friends or when I wanted to impress a new company. My story has to do with my mother's heroism. I was just born then. My mother told me that on that day, many women in labour were admitted to the hospital. It was a terrible winter outside, cold and snowing for the first time that year in our country. Daddy stood waiting in the corridor, not allowed in by his mother. The doctors, who quickly delivered the baby, went to another woman, and mum was transferred to a room a couple of hours later. Though my father had paid for a private room, after a while there was a knock on the door, and another woman and her son were brought to the couch. Dad was arising, but there was no room, so mum said it was okay, and that she didn't mind. They both became friends. Some complications arose, and they spent a couple more days together in the hospital than they were supposed to. So, during that time, the nurses confused me with that boy more than once. I was named Cook, and that boy was named Dick. But first and last names were the only difference. Thing is, he and I had absolutely identical bodies. We even looked alike on our faces, like brothers. We had everything similar, blood type, RH factor, some more physiological signs, height, weight, and we were even born at the same time. Our mothers laughed at first, saying that maybe it was a good sign. Maybe we will become great friends in the future, or fate will play a role. Just kidding, but after a couple of hours, Dick suddenly got sick. Cardiac arrest. Before his and my mum's eyes, a whole team of neonatologists and surgeons pumped him out. It turned out he had a congenital pathological heart and kidney disease. The doctors, of course, eliminated some factors that affect his current condition. But it was definitely decided that a heart and kidney replacement surgery was necessary. As you know, dead newborns are not so few, but also not so many. It is even more difficult not only to find someone who agrees to give his child for a transplant, but also that donor who will fit all the parameters. At first, my mum comforted that woman. She helped her in every way she could with groceries. My dad even bought some money. They decided to keep that woman and Dick in the hospital under observation for the time being. He didn't have a father, and the woman was alone. My parents felt sorry for her, so they paid for part of her stay and didn't charge for the private room. She bowed at their feet, cried and thanked them. In the evening, my mother was informed that she could leave the hospital in the morning. You are so happy, you have a good husband and a healthy son, said the ward mate. Mum said good night and went to bed. The nurses took me to another room for the night so that my mother could rest, and they promised to bring me in for feeding. Mum said that in the middle of the night she woke up suddenly. For some reason her heart was not in place. She immediately turned round and saw the woman was gone. Mum ran with all her might to the neonatology department, the night doctors on duty, and saw that they were asleep right behind the desk. She looked in the cradle, but I wasn't there. My mum panicked and started waking up the doctors and screaming that I'd been stolen. It was neither the woman, nor Dick, nor me. Panic ensued. The hospital made a fuss. My mother called my father, and he was on the way with the police. In her weak state, my mother ran up and down all the floors and dumbly burst into every room looking for me. She searched all the back rooms, the resident rooms, and even the toilets, but the woman was nowhere to be found. Mum ran out into the parking lot and saw blood on the ground. Her heart nearly stopped. She followed the trail of blood drops and found her roommate getting into the car. The blood was hers. A caesarean wound had apparently oozed out. The car was already pulling out of the parking space. My mum was barefoot in one robe, spreading her arms, screaming, trying to stop the crazy woman. That woman was crying. You could hear the kids screaming in the back seat. My mother didn't even feel the cold. She opened her eyes wide and showed me to give her the baby. The guards came running out and that woman gasped. Instead of jumping away, my mother jumped on the hood and grabbed the windshield wipers. Give me my son, my mum yelled. That woman yelling that she couldn't give her me, that she needed me. She didn't even slow down, just pulled out of the parking lot into the street. My mother desperately clawing at the car even more. Then she managed to grab the hood harder. The woman pulled onto the road where she almost had an accident. Cars honking, snow falling, and they went on and on. The mother shouted with the last of her strength she would not give up her child anyway, and the car crashed into a tree. The mother fell to the floor, severely injuring her leg. That woman hit the steering wheel and lost consciousness. Mum opened the car and saw that we were okay. Dick and I were screaming a lot, but we were well strapped into the cradle. My mum pulled me out and held me to her chest. It was cold, and she wrapped me in a blanket and wanted to walk towards the hospital, but she stopped. Dick was screaming his head off. Mum came back. At first she looked at him and was silent. Her feet were standing in the snow, already red from the cold, but she didn't feel it. 
It seemed to her that there was nothing. It was only her and Dick and me and the silence around her. Her heart was full of anger, but at the sight of the baby, she realized one thing for herself. Then she wrapped Dick up and carried us both to the hospital where the police had already arrived. Dad came running in, shocked. Mum had carried us for about a mile. She was naked, limping, and her leg was bleeding. She didn't say a word. She just walked into the hospital and called the doctors. The three of us were immediately sent to the ICU to check on her condition. That woman was arrested on the spot. My father promised to sue her for the rest of her life, and she just asked where her son was. My dad replied that my mum had taken him. While she was being handcuffed, she was thanking me through her tears and asking me to take care of her baby. Are you out of your mind to ask for that? My father yelled. I understand her feelings. She had just given birth to a long-awaited baby, and he had already been given a terminal diagnosis. But we shouldn't have to pay for it. It's not our fault it turned out this way, my mother said. When the doctors made sure we were okay, mum got a couple of stitches in her leg, and my mum came into the room and fed me, then Dick. We fell asleep on her chest. After the proceedings, mum was told she could go home. Dick was taken away by the doctors. Mum asked what would happen to him, and the doctor said he would rather be placed in an orphanage while his mother handled legal matters. Mum's heart clenched. His father had said more than once that we shouldn't take responsibility for him, that his mother had tried to kill me. But Dick had nothing to do with it. He has something to do with it. He's innocent. His mother was trying to save her child, and if I were in her shoes, I don't know what I would do, said Mum. At this point, the father realised it was useless to argue, because, because my mother had already made up her mind. She made her decision the moment she went back to get Dick in the car. She had already made her decision when she fed him and put him to sleep on her chest, next to me. She had already figured it out and she had made up her mind. Yes, you got that right. Dick's mother was convicted for many years. She had several episodes from stealing a child to illegal transplantation to attempted murder and so on. That was the last time she saw Dick that day and my parents got custody and adopted him. It's been many years since then. He and I are 14 years old now. My parents have managed to find good doctors and keep my brother's heart and kidneys running smoothly for all these years without surgery. We believe a miracle played a role here, or maybe God helped us, or him. My mum visits Dick's mum from time to time. That woman thanks her to this day. My brother and I didn't hide anything from her. My parents told it like it was, and Dick is glad they made that decision. He loves us, and we love him. His brother is very grateful to his parents for everything, but he is not ready to go to his mother yet. He says he'll make that decision on his own. He doesn't hold a grudge or resentment against her. He just wants to mature a little. But overall, he is part of our family, and my mum is our pride and support. She still has that same scar on her leg from that day. It's like a reminder to all of us of the power of a mother's love. Mum always says she has two sons, two rewards, like a blessing for something good. My name is Gloria, and I have been the only and most beloved child for most of my conscious life. Do you know how great it is to be the only one? This is when all attention is focused only on you, when everything is delicious, only to you, when you are taken to your grandmother, where you are waiting for goodies, cartoons, new toys, and sometimes pocket money, and everything is done for you. When my parents got married, they worked hard to buy their dream house as soon as possible. The years flew by, and they were all saving up and saving up money. Finally, this happy moment had to come. They were able to acquire housing. My mother told me how euphoric they were flying with my father, because having a roof over your head is a fairy tale. Well, then it dawned on them that it was time to have children, and then the problem started. In short, my mother could not get pregnant for a long time, so she was forced to undergo several different courses of treatment together with my father. It is good that they supported each other, did not retreat, and did not fight for happiness. As a result, after a few pounds of medication, my mother was diagnosed with infertility. She and dad weren't ready for this, although it's unlikely that anyone will be ready for this at all. Their hands dropped, my father began to drink, my mother closed in on herself. It was as if their home had become a storehouse of grief and tears, rather than the happy moments they had planned. And then, when their marriage almost broke up, my mother's mother came and threw up the idea to adopt a baby. It became something of a second wind for my parents. They seriously thought about it, began to study the issue and collect documents. They didn't care if it was a boy or a girl, but a child. On that exciting day, when they came to watch the children, a barefoot, 
dirty girl ran out of the orphanage, grabbed both of them by the hands, shouted, Mom, let's go home! And my parents' hearts fell in love. It was me, the little girl who met them on the doorstep. My parents vowed to tell me the truth about who I was and where I came from. I still don't know my birth mother, and I don't really want to, because I've really had a good time with them all these years. I received as much warmth, care, and affection as many children from the orphanage did not receive. So we can safely say that I had a happy childhood. Definitely. And then one day, when I came home from school, I found my parents at home. They were sitting in the kitchen whispering, dad hugging mom tight, both of them crying and smiling. I didn't understand what was going on. When they saw me, they called me to them, hugged me tightly, and said, Honey, you're going to have a little brother or sister. They probably expected a different reaction, but I wasn't happy about the news. I immediately imagined the whole nightmare waiting for me. Of course, this is great news for my parents. And maybe if I wasn't adopted, it would have been great news for me too. But no, not for the girl from the orphanage. Not for her. I knew perfectly well that my own child is my own. And I will always remain a stranger. And when the baby is born, they will understand the difference in us. They will feel that this baby is more native to them. Which means that I am no longer needed. Will I be returned to the orphanage again? I asked with a terrible voice. My parents protested. Of course, they called it stupid and said that I was their own child. But I understood that it only took time. As the months passed, my mother's belly grew rounder and bigger. Along with it, my anxiety grew in my heart. I stopped being that carefree, cheerful girl, stopped kissing and hugging my parents. I didn't go near my mother's stomach. I didn't listen to it. I didn't talk to it. And I didn't want to touch it at all. Because there was a person growing up who would get me out of the house. I knew it and waited. Well, then something happened that should have happened. My father took my mother to the hospital. I was sent to my grandparents. I waited for several annoying hours until finally my father called and said, Girl, I heard how happy grandfather and grandma were, how they congratulated them, each other, and then they came to kiss me. But I pulled away, locked myself in the bathroom, and cried there for 20 minutes. The next day, my father came to pick me up and said we were going to see my little sister. He reacted to my denials with laughter, translated everything into a joke, then put me in the car and drove away. As soon as I crossed the threshold of the hospital, I was handed an ugly bouquet of flowers, and then my mother came out with a pink envelope in her hands. When she saw me, she began to smile, ran up to me, gave my father's envelope, and began to hug me. I missed her very much, and I was worried, and I only realized it when I hugged her. My eyes filled with tears. And then my father held up the pink envelope in which the little red ball was sleeping with its eyes closed. Her name is Eliza, my father said. This is your little sister, he added. The words made me want to throw up. The longer I looked at it, the more I realized that it was the essence of my end, or rather, the end of their love for me. We arrived home, where the four of us stayed, and against our background, I noticed how scrupulous my parents are about every sneeze. They kept running after her. My mother spent 24 hours with her seven days a week. My father worked and in the evenings barely had time to eat, take a shower, play with a baby and passed out. There was no time for me. I belonged to myself and this thought lived in my head along with a feeling of hatred for my sister. The more she grew, the more my loneliness grew. Looking at my mother's phone, her entire photo gallery was filled with photos of her and mine, once, twice, and not enough. In general, the first year of Eliza's life was the worst in my life, even worse than in the orphanage, and I told myself that I can't take it anymore. I wrote a note, left it on the table, packed my things, and left the house. My parents thought I went to school as usual, and they didn't even ask me why I had such a big bag. I knew that there was no more room in their hearts for me. That day, I walked where I had to, turned off the phone, and ran around the city. When it got dark, I found a rotten motel, wandered there, and began to think about how to continue to live. Because I did not want to go back to the orphanage, I spent the night there, if you can say so, because I didn't sleep. I didn't eat most of the day, and there was a lump of resentment and unspoken words in my throat. The next morning, I decided to go to a nearby city to get a little lost. 
I needed to find some work and a permanent bed. But when I was buying tickets, a woman looked at me askance, and a minute later, a policeman came up to me. At the sight of him, I ran towards the subway. I ran as fast as I could, but they caught up with me and grabbed my bag. An angry employee immediately put me in the car and drove me to the police station, where my parents and Eliza rushed in an hour later. I was sitting on the bench, crying, and my mom and dad were saying in both ears that I was a stupid girl. They took me home, interrogated me. My father was mad. My mother was either crying or yelling. It's not clear at all. Then Eliza came up to me with hesitant steps. In the middle of all this fuss, her footsteps seemed so soft. She came clumsily up to me as I sat on the floor, put her arms around my face, and said, Gloria! My name! She called my name. Her first word was my name. Gloria. Oh my god, you have no idea how I felt at that moment. My heart sank. My parents fell silent, and I, I suddenly put my arms around her. And for the first time in her tiny life, I kissed her. Something had changed in me, and I couldn't hate her. My Eliza. Another year has passed since then, and I discussed old grievances with my mom and dad, and I realized that I am still as important to them as before. Only now, there are more of us in their lives.